This is the FM Gold Channel of All India Radio. In the program News Analysis, now we bring you a discussion on successful launch of Agni the Fifth missile. The participants are Commodore Uday Bhaskar, Security Analyst, and Ranjit Kumar, Diplomatic Editor, Navbharat Times. India has successfully launched the 5,000 km range Agni 5 ballistic missile. It was indeed a proud moment for Indian missile scientists. Commodore Uday Bhaskar, what is the significance of today's launch of Agni 5 missile? As you have rightly observed, it is a very successful day for the entire DRDO team, that is Defense Research and Development, which has been pursuing the integrated guided missile development program for the last 30 years. We are now in 2013 and we are reviewing the success of the launch of the Agni 5 today. And I think it merits recall that it was in 1983 when we had Prime Minister Indira Gandhi that India had embarked upon what is called as the Integrated Guided Missile Development Program, the IGMDP. And today's Agni 5, the 5,000 kilometer intercontinental ballistic missile, to me is testimony to India's perseverance. The reason I'm talking about the last 30 years is that India's own history in terms of acquiring certain strategic capabilities, particularly in relation to missile technology, has been a very daunting task. The reason being, you will recall, that after the Indian peaceful nuclear explosion of 1974, the United States and other Western allies imposed very severe sanctions on India. Many of them were India-specific. So from 1978 till as recently as 2008, when we saw the beginning of the dismantling of these regimes, they have not totally gone. India has been isolated. India has been ostracized. India has been denied any kind of access to high technology. So to me as an analyst, the real success or the greater achievement is that the Indian scientific community within the DRDO and other agencies which have contributed both in the private sector, in the academia and various other parts of the Indian effort that they could persevere and get the success of a very complex technology. And I would be the first person to add that this is not the end of the story. Meaning that if you recall the Agni was first tested, the Agni 5 in 2012, in April of last year. Now we are in September of 2013. This will need a few more tests before it can be operationally inducted. So today's test is very important in terms of the technological credibility, what you might call as a development path towards the ultimate operationalization of the missile. But the fact that India has been able to do this on its own at a time when the global community led by the US had placed these sanctions and denied India high technology is a great achievement. And I think there are many lessons that need to be learned in terms of reviewing India's achievements as far as missile technology are concerned. Commodore Bhaskar, you very correctly pointed out that India initiated its missile program way back in 1983. But ever since India began its program, the Western countries, the developed countries ganged up against India and they formed a missile technology control regime. They put international export control regimes on India and prevented all sorts of dual export of dual use technology to India. In spite of that, India could overcome this hurdle. And today is the moment when India has achieved this success. So what is the significance of this you know, in view of the international control regimes, India could achieve this. How India could do that? I think we should draw the right lessons, meaning that today there is a very clear understanding that access to high technology will give countries a certain profile when it comes to what is called as trans-border military capability. For instance, the missile itself, the fact that today India is capable of delivering a missile over a range of 5,000 kilometers gives you an indication as to what certain kinds of technology can give a nation by way of its quote-unquote strategic capability. Yes, it is true that India was isolated by the global community and here I think we must make a distinction that at a time when the United States had introduced legislation that was specifically targeted against India, the former Soviet Union had provided considerable support to India. You will recall that India and the former USSR had a fairly robust and close relationship in a number of areas. And we must also concede that in critical technologies, the former Soviet Union had 
provided very valuable support, whether it is satellites, whether it is the nuclear technology, whether it is in our missile development. And I think this is something that's part of the history. But today in 2013, I think the lesson that India has to draw is that yes, because of the way in which major states interpret what they see as their own interest, certain initiatives are taken. And specific to the nuclear issue, India had been isolated. But yet, and I think this is to the credit of India, and let me also say to the international community, that while India had been targeted, India's own scientific endeavor, scientific pursuits were also continuing apace, and India was able to maintain what you might call as a fairly close political relationship with countries like the United States and other members of the Western Alliance, and this was largely because of India's profile. So in the Cold War, though we were non-aligned, we had a certain tension with the United States over the nuclear issue. We had a reasonably working relationship, a close relationship with Moscow. But yet, we were able to invest in and continue what you might call as a scientific endeavor. And there were three critical areas for India. One is nuclear technology, which goes back to the days of Dr. Homi Bhabha. The second was in the area of satellites, where again, India has made some very impressive strides. And the third was in missile development. And all three have been successfully nurtured by what you might call as a certain determination and a very, very persistent or a very high degree of perseverance as far as the Indian establishment was concerned. Now today, the reason I'm going back into the slightly detailed history is that in 2013, India's profile has changed. We have nuclear weapons. We have a proven satellite capability. We have a proven missile capability. So there is a need for India to also contribute to what you might call as the management of WMD. The MTCR that you quoted is one example of trying to regulate the acquisition of missile technology. In like fashion, the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, was a means to try and regulate the nuclear technology. So I think India today, because of its proven capability, should come to the table with some kind of, I would say, understanding that this is a domain that has to be managed in a more equitable way than it was in the past. And the Indian experience, I think, can give some indication about what are the inadequacies in the existing arrangement, which lead to the kind of situations the world is often talking about. Iran and the nuclear issue, Syria and chemical weapons, North Korea and its own WMD challenge. So I think the need to manage the domain of weapons of mass destruction, in which we include all of them, nuclear, chemical, biological, missiles, and ensure that we have what might be described or deemed to be a fair and equitable arrangement, which is not easy, but I think we have to strive towards that object. But you said India was targeted under various export control regimes, and in spite of MTCR, we see a proliferation of missiles in, in the India's neighborhood. Pakistan gets technology and missiles from China. China has ignored the MTCR, and the international community has not been able to impose any sanctions on China. See, the reason again is that the reality of the international community is that when you say that, first of all, they introduce certain treaties which are bilateral or at the instance of a single country. For instance, the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty does not have any UN sanction. It is not a global treaty that is mandated by the UN. It was spearheaded by the United States and the other powers also joined because they felt it was quote-unquote in their own interest. Now, the NPT is a very interesting treaty that it was in a way brought into the global stage in the mid-70s, particularly after India's nuclear test in 1974. But countries like France and China joined the NPT only in 1992. They had nuclear weapons. They carried out tests, if you remember, both of them, and only then did they join because they felt their national interest would not be adversely impacted. Similarly with the MTCR. And since you mentioned China, China today is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. So very often when we talk about the global determination what is the global consensus on matters of strategic capability it is always decided by the so-called big five that is the united states france and uk are on one side the so-called western alliance then you have moscow russia and the fifth is china now china has taken its own national interest to be the critical aspect and therefore on mtcr china has very innovatively 
interpreted the MTCR so that its actions are not in any way constrained. For instance, the cooperation with Pakistan or China's engagement with North Korea. Because if you look at the WMD program of North Korea and of Pakistan, you find Chinese fingerprints very clearly. But China's response is that we joined the NPT only in 1992. We joined the MTCR only much later in the mid-2000 period. And therefore, whatever we did was prior to our joining the treaty. And all the definitions of the MTCR, 300 kilometers and things of that sort, they interpret them by saying that we are exporting missiles whose range is 299 kilometers. So technically you are within the treaty. But the spirit of the treaty is not being respected. So I think India is living with this reality that though there are so many treaties, there yet is a proliferation, as you rightly observe, both of nuclear weapon capability and of missile capability. And in this, you also have the role played by the so-called non-state actor, the Dr. A.Q. Khan network, which today the entire professional community is aware, was really being supported by the Pakistani establishment for their own reasons. But this is the reality that India has to address. And therefore, in many ways, the Agni 5 is representative of India's own determination to acquire a certain minimum capacity, a certain modest capacity, so that its own deterrent profile becomes more credible. So Agni-5 will act as a deterrent for those countries who are developing their own missile systems, long-range missile systems, nuclear-capable missile systems to threaten India. Yes, you know, in a way, basically I think it would be misleading to look at the ballistic missile as a one-on-one. Because unfortunately, very often, whenever we have a missile test in India, I say this, you know, in a slightly, I would say, lighter way, but the message is very clear that every missile test should not be seen as a kabaddi match, meaning that countries move towards acquiring a more robust, credible deterrent profile, which has many components. For instance, the experience of the major powers is that the most reliable deterrent is the intercontinental ballistic missile on a submarine, which is called the submarine launched ballistic missile. India is making some steady progress in a quiet way there. For instance, we have the Arihant, which is currently the reactor has gone critical. And we also have 700 kilometers missile on it. But that is of a smaller range. Ultimately, we are hoping to have the equivalent of a submarine launched ballistic missile of a credible range. And the success of the Agni 5 is going to allow us to look at that option. So today's test of the Agni 5 is a step in that direction, that India will have a delivery platform like the Agni 5, which has got both the range and the accuracy. At a later stage, we will have to make the nuclear warhead. That will give you what you might call as the appropriate credibility. And what this does is to, in a way, enhance or make India's no first use commitment more credible. You are now demonstrating your ability to deliver a certain payload over a range of 5,000 kilometers. So therefore, what it does is that when we talk about whom does this really affect, whom is the signal to, it is to other powers who have this kind of a capability. And in this case, we are talking about China, whose own intercontinental ballistic missile capability has an adverse impact on India's overall security. So this, in a way, provides a certain degree of assurance to India. And ultimately, this is what the weapon of mass destruction does. It allows a certain degree of assurance to deal with an existing insecurity. Just as China has its own insecurity, say, in relation to the United States of America. And we must not forget that Russia also has a certain relevance when we look at the Chinese matrix. So these are all interrelated. So the ballistic missile is not an artillery gun. It is not a super Bofors. What it is doing is to increase or improve the texture of deterrence the ambiance of deterrence and therefore India has to keep maintaining the steady progress both in terms of the land-based missile like the Agni and also pursue the project like the Arihant, the nuclear submarine, which will finally at some point have a ballistic missile fitted on the submarine. The successful launch of Agni-5 missile has raised India's profile in the strategy community. Thank you, Commodore Dev Bhaskar. Thank you. You were listening to a discussion on successful launch of Agni-5 missile. The participants were Commodore Uday Bhaskar, Security Analyst, and Ranjit Kumar, Diplomatic Editor, Navarat Times. It came to you in the program News Analysis, produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. This program is also available on our website, newsonair.nic.in. You may email your opinion about this program 
at airnsdtalks at gmail.com.